You get a message that your lab results are back. You quickly click the link, take a deep breath, and start scrolling. Some numbers are green. Some are red. Should you be concerned? If a result is red, does that mean something is dangerous? And if it's green, does that really mean there's nothing to worry about? I'm Dr. Bairn, and in this video, we'll go over the 10 most misunderstood blood tests and explain what your results can and cannot tell you and why they need to be interpreted carefully. Number one, let's start with hemoglobin A1c, one of the most commonly used lab tests for blood sugar and why it can be confusing. Hemoglobin A1c is a way to estimate your average blood sugar over the past two to three months. It looks at the percentage of red blood cells that have glucose attached to them. Normal hemoglobin A1c is below 5.7%, prediabetes is between 5.7 and 6.4%, and diabetes is 6.5% or higher. So why is it frequently misunderstood? Because hemoglobin A1c depends on red blood cells, any condition that affects the red blood cells can make your hemoglobin A1c artificially low or high. For example, anemia, iron deficiency, recent blood loss or transfusions, kidney disease. If you have one of these conditions, your hemoglobin A1c may look normal, but it does not reflect the true sugar average. You could think that your sugar is under control, when it's not. Even if your red blood cells are normal, hemoglobin A1c only gives a partial picture of the blood sugar. It reflects an average, but it doesn't show high spikes and low dips. So you can have periods of very high sugar and very low sugar, yet the average looks normal. Why does this matter? Studies show that wide swings in blood sugar highs and lows are linked to increased oxidative stress and inflammation and can damage the blood vessels. So even if your average sugar or your hemoglobin A1c looks good, your body is still exposed to oxidative stress. So we can use a continuous sensor that checks the sugar all day and all night. In some cases, people that use the sensor may see that their hemoglobin A1c looks excellent because they actually have a lot of low sugars. When when medications are adjusted to prevent their low sugars, their average sugar actually goes up. So their hemoglobin A1c goes up as well. And that makes it look like the diabetes is worse. But their overall metabolic health actually improves because they're avoiding dangerous lows and large sugar swings. Hemoglobin A1c is certainly a very useful test, but it's only part of the story. For a complete picture of glucose control, consider continuous glucose monitoring or finger stick readings to see variability, not just averages. Number two, TSH. Thyroid stimulating hormone is made by the pituitary gland in the brain. Its job is to tell the thyroid how much thyroid hormone to make. This lab is often misunderstood because TSH and thyroid hormone work in opposite directions. When there is too much thyroid in the blood, the pituitary senses this and lowers the TSH to tell the thyroid to slow down. When there is not enough thyroid hormone, the pituitary responds by raising the TSH to push the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. This can cause confusion when patients look at their lab results on their own before coming to the doctor's visit. Seeing a high or a low TSH, they may think it means they need to do something that's the opposite of what's actually correct. In general, a high TSH means that the body needs more thyroid hormone and a low TSH means that the body has too much thyroid hormone. Some people get confused and change their medications the wrong way, raising the dose when they should lower it or lowering the dose when they should raise it. Another confusing fact about TSH is that it is made by the pituitary gland, not the thyroid. So if there is a problem with the pituitary, then the TSH level is not reliable. I have a patient who came into the office wearing sunglasses. My medical assistant actually joked with her that she must be hiding from the paparazzi. But when she told me that she had a severe headache and she was wearing the sunglasses because she was sensitive to the light, I became very concerned. She was actually diagnosed with pituitary apoplexy, which is a sudden bleed into the pituitary gland. This is a medical emergency and her pituitary had to be surgically removed. Because the pituitary is gone, she cannot make TSH anymore. So her TSH level is always low, even when her thyroid hormone level is just right. This caused problems. Every time she saw a new family doctor, they would see the low TSH and try to lower her thyroid medication, thinking that she was getting too much. Each time this happened, she felt terrible because the thyroid dose became too low. After going through this several times, she finally told the doctors, if you don't mind, I would like my endocrinologist to manage my thyroid. 
Number three, thyroid antibodies. Thyroid peroxidase antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies are tests for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. When thyroid antibodies are positive, it usually means Hashimoto's, where the immune system slowly damages the thyroid. But this can be confusing because some people have Hashimoto's even when their antibody tests are negative. That's because the immune attack can happen inside the thyroid itself and not show up in the blood test. Also, the thyroid has many parts that the immune system can attack, but we only test for two types of antibodies, so the blood tests don't catch everything. So positive antibodies help confirm Hashimoto's, but negative antibodies do not always rule it out. Another misunderstood issue about thyroid antibodies is that even though Hashimoto's often leads to hypothyroidism, it doesn't happen right away for everyone. In some people, the thyroid works normally for years before the hormone levels start to drop. Antibody numbers also do not tell how severe the disease is. Higher antibody levels do not always mean worse symptoms. Number four, creatinine. We often check creatinine to see how well the kidneys are working, but it can be confusing because creatinine doesn't come from the kidneys, it comes from your muscles. Anything that adds creatinine to the blood can make it go up, even if your kidneys are fine. This includes having more muscle mass, eating a lot of meat, taking creatine supplements, exercise or muscle injury, and dehydration because less water in the blood makes creatinine more concentrated. So a small rise in creatinine does not always mean that your kidneys are in trouble. On the other hand, even a small increase in creatinine can mean a big drop in kidney function. For example, example, if someone stays the same size with the same muscle mass and their creatinine goes up from 1 to 1.2, that represents about 20% drop in kidney function. So creatinine is helpful, but it has to be interpreted carefully. Number five. Next, we'll go over two common liver tests, ALT and AST. These are enzymes found inside cells, mostly in the liver, but also in muscles. When cells are injured or stressed, these enzymes leak into the blood. That means a high ALT or AST shows that some cells have been damaged, but it doesn't automatically mean that your liver is unhealthy. Hard exercise, muscle injury, infections, or certain medications can temporarily raise these numbers. In many cases, the liver itself is working well and the levels return to normal once the cause is resolved. On the other hand, people with serious liver problems can have completely normal ALT and AST. This happens because ALT and AST rise when liver cells are actively injured, but in advanced liver disease, there may be fewer healthy cells left to actually release these enzymes. That's why we look at additional tests like bilirubin, albumin, and platelets. ALT and AST are useful tests, but they only tell part of the story. Number six, Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a part of the red blood cell that carries oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body. Because it's so important, many people get worried when they see abnormal results and they ask, doctor, is this dangerous? Well, the answer isn't always straightforward. Some people have low hemoglobin all their lives because of inherited conditions like thalassemia, and it usually doesn't cause problems. Other people might have high hemoglobin because of dehydration or living in high altitude. But on the other hand, even mild increase or decrease in hemoglobin level can be a sign of a serious condition. Low hemoglobin may be a sign of bleeding in the body, so we check for colon cancer. High hemoglobin may be a sign of sleep apnea because the oxygen levels drop at night so the body makes extra red blood cells to carry more oxygen. So indeed, hemoglobin is confusing because even mild abnormalities can mean serious underlying problems. Number seven, high calcium. It's not unusual for people to have a high calcium in their blood test for a long time before they get checked. Sometimes people assume it's because they're taking calcium supplements or eating a lot of dairy, but high calcium should not be ignored and should be evaluated properly. One important cause of high calcium is primary hyperparathyroidism, or too much parathyroid hormone. In this condition, calcium is high and PTH is high, and calcium is being pulled out of the bones, which can lead to kidney stones, bone loss, and calcium deposits in the blood vessels. What is confusing is when calcium is high, the parathyroid hormone should be low. So if the parathyroid hormone is normal, it is actually inappropriately normal, and we may still be dealing 
dealing with primary hyperparathyroidism. Number eight, bioidentical versus non-bioidentical hormones. If you're taking hormones that are not bioidentical, the lab test is not designed to detect those hormones. So your lab results may not reflect the true hormone exposure in your body. That means your levels might look normal, but your body is still experiencing the effects and potential risks of the non-bioidentical hormones. For example, estrogen. If a woman is taking Premarin, it is not bioidentical estradiol. It does contain some estradiol, but it also contains many other forms of estrogen. So if the lab measures estradiol, it does not reflect all the estrogen the body is getting. Another example is testosterone. Some men health clinics prescribe a combination of bioidentical and non-bioidentical testosterone. When the lab measures testosterone, it might look normal, but the body is still exposed to the effect of the non-bioidentical component. Another example is cortisol. Hydrocortisone is identical to natural cortisol, so labs will detect it accurately. But medications like dexamethasone do not show up as cortisol. In fact, when you take dexamethasone, it suppresses your body's natural cortisol production. So a cortisol lab drawn while taking dexamethasone will actually show low cortisol, but you are still exposed to the effect of the steroid. So it is important that you tell your doctors exactly what hormones you are taking and understand that standard lab results may not capture the full picture if non-bioidentical hormones are involved. Number nine, PSA or prostate-specific antigen. It's a protein made by the prostate. Doctors measure it to screen for prostate cancer. PSA can be a little confusing because it can go up for a lot of reasons that are not cancer. An enlarged prostate, which is quite common as men get older, can raise PSA. Also, there are things that raise PSA temporarily, like sexual activity or ejaculation, urinary tract infections or prostatitis. Also, putting pressure on your prostate from riding a bike or sitting on a hard chair can raise the PSA. So before you get your PSA blood test, make sure to avoid ejaculation and minimize pressure on your prostate for at least 24 hours. This helps make sure your PSA results are more accurate. Another situation in which doctors also watch PSA say closely is when a man starts testosterone treatment to see how the prostate responds. When testosterone is low before treatment, PSA is usually lower than normal because the prostate is not getting enough hormone to produce PSA at its usual level. After starting testosterone, the prostate starts producing PSA more normally, so PSA can go up a little. This small increase is expected and normal, but once the prostate reaches its saturation point, extra testosterone does not make the PSA go higher. Doctors usually get concerned if PSA goes up more than 1.4 points in a year, even if the number is still within the normal range. This can be confusing because the PSA is technically normal, but the rise is faster than expected. When this happens, we usually refer the person to a urologist, a specialist who can check the prostate more closely to make sure everything is okay. And finally, number 10, fasting. In another video, I mentioned that if your doctor asks you to fast for your labs, you should not eat anything and not drink anything other than water, not even coffee. Well, that video really sparked a lot of reactions, and there are a few reasons why. First, many people were surprised that something as simple and calorie-free as black coffee could affect lab results. But research shows that caffeine in black coffee can temporarily reduce insulin sensitivity and raise blood glucose even in healthy adults. Some viewers also mentioned that their clinics specifically don't require fasting for certain lab tests, and there are good reasons for that as well. Many labs indeed don't require fasting, like thyroid blood test, white cell, platelets, red cells, liver test, and other tests. Also, if you already have diabetes, your doctors will likely rely more on a hemoglobin A1c than a single fasting glucose. But here's the main point. Fasting gives the most accurate picture of your metabolic health. If you don't fast and your sugar comes back high, you won't know if it's because of prediabetes, diabetes, or just that coffee and cream you just had. Of course, if your sugar comes back normal, even without fasting, great! Think of it like this. Remember in high school when the teacher said if you come to the exam well prepared, you'll do well. 
If you don't prepare, your results may not reflect your true abilities. Of course, there are always some students who don't study and still do fine. That happens with lab tests too. Some people can eat a full breakfast, show up for blood work, and their sugar comes back perfectly normal. Some people can ride their bike in the Tour de France one day and get their PSA the next day, and it still will be normal. The key is that if you don't want to take chances with falsely abnormal tests, the safest approach is to prepare properly. Follow the fasting instructions, avoid anything that can skew the results, and get a clean, accurate picture of your health. Doing so has several benefits. You will have reliable results that can be compared with future tests to track your health over time. You will reduce the risk of stress in unnecessary follow-up tests, and you can prevent falsely abnormal tests from appearing in your medical records, which could potentially be interpreted as a health issue that you don't actually have. Thank you very much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and share with someone who may need it. This is not medical advice and for educational purposes only. See you in the next one.